Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Caird and Kirk this morning. Before we start, I've got a very important announcement, actually. Um, as most of you know, this, will, this is my first service as an ordained minister. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. However, I watched your service from a couple weeks ago, and I saw your minister, Stuart, give a stern warning that if I was to turn up in a dog collar, that I was to get dog's abuse. So where's your camera? Stuart, this is how you dress for work. <laughs> I, I'll tell how. I tried the ponytail, it fell off. <laughs> Welcome to Calern Church this morning. We do have some intimations. I was told this morning that I'm now part of the furniture. I don't get a welcome and somebody to do my intimations for me. Um, we have a leaf party. What's a leaf party? Ah, right. If you'd, if you'd like to come to my garden, I'm going to have one too. Um, I'm the Struthenric Singers having a coffee morning on Saturday, 28th October from 10 till 12 in the Kirk Halls. Um, and we're going to have some inf more information about the shoebox appeal. <laughs> Get your stopwatches ready. <laughs> well, I promised Ian it wouldn't take up half the sermon today. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you who have, who have made up the boxes. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. And my counterpart in South Lane has had the opportunity to go on holiday for a week. So, in fact, that gives you all another week. The boxes will still be here next Sunday, and I'm taking them away on the Monday. So if anybody wants to do something, you can still do it. But thank you for your effort. Thank you very much. I would just say, think of the joy when somebody receives that box. Think of the smile on their face when they realize that you, here in Kalern, total strangers, probably never heard of Kalern, but you have thought about them. They will be so pleased. They are called the boxes of smiles. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 95. If you would repeat the words in bold for me. Can you move the slide on for me, please? Oh, well, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. For the Lord is a great God. And a great King above all gods. Let us stand and begin our worship by singing Mission Praise number 327, Immortal Invisible.
Please be seated. Let us approach the throne of God in prayer. Glorious is our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, you robe yourself in light and splendor. And the heavens declare your majesty, power, and might. Nothing is comparable to you, O Lord. You possess a beauty that is unmatched in time and eternity. And we can only glimpse such a small part of your glory, but it is enough to completely transform us. You are welcome in this, your house. Come into our presence this morning and minister to us. Surround us with your love and mercy and show us your glory today. As we are gathered in this sacred space, grant us the strength to lay down the worries of the weak, no matter what weighs heavy on our hearts. However big and cumbersome the yoke on our shoulders, lift it off us that we can focus on you for this hour. We claim the promise of Jesus when he said, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Lord God, you invite us to gather in your presence to worship you. Open our lips that we may offer fitting praise and worship to you. Increase our faith that we may trust and love you more. The Bible tells us that we love because you first loved us. And we bless you that Jesus Christ opened the way to a closer, more intimate relationship with you. Help us not to be fearful or timid as we draw as you draw us to yourself give us a holy boldness as we approach your throne of grace lord jesus we bless you for your salvation work on the cross as we look to you show us the wonder of the cross for without you we would be lost and without hope help us to hurry to you leaving behind our sin, our fears, and our doubts. Holy Spirit, empower us today with a fresh anointing of divine power. Give us a renewed zeal for God and the, glo and the glory of your great name. As you brooded over the waters of creation, brood over us, your people. Awaken us now to new life that you bring. We wait on you in Kalernkirk this morning so that our strength will be renewed, so that we can leave here soaring on wings like eagles, running and not growing weary, walking without fainting. Thank you for being with us this morning and we dedicate this hour completely to you. All this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I always believe that the children's address is for children from ages of naught to 99. So I want to ask you this morning, feel free to shout out, but who's your favorite superhero? Spider-Man, love Spider-Man. Do we have any other advance on Spider-Man? I've given mine away already. I love Superman. Do we have any others? No Batman fans here? No? Well, I tell you, I'm going to tell you why I love Superman. Because he's my hero. He's faster than a speeding bullet. He's more powerful than a locomotive. But he's also kind. And he's fair. He fights against crime. He fights against injustice. But most of all, he hides his costume under his clothes. And whenever there's danger, he's ready for action. He runs into the nearest phone box and he's got his Superman outfit underneath. Would you believe I actually bought a Superman t-shirt yesterday? <laughs> thinking that would be a really good moment. It's just as well I remembered I didn't wear it. I 
I wish this pen worked for my slides. And here we are, that's the point. He keeps his outfit under his, under his shirt. But there's one thing, and this is, this is the one thing I wanted to bring up Superman. You must be asking, why is this guy talking about Superman in a church? But there's something about Superman that I really love. If you could move the slide on one more for me, please. You see, when Superman feels weak or he's tired and he feels his tank running low, he rises out of the atmosphere, he rises out of the earth and he regenerates in the light of the sun. Can you hear the sermon in this already? I love that. I must have watched this when I was young. I wasn't thinking about sermons at that stage. But it's wonderful. He spends time in the rays of the sun and he gets revived. He, gets, he feels his strength coming back to him. Enough that he can fly back to earth and fight crime and beat the bad guys one more time. And I've always loved these children's addresses growing up because you always get these funny stories and then the minister will say, and that's just like Jesus. But this is just like Jesus. When we spend time with the Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we have our strength renewed. We spend time with them reading, about, reading his story we speak to him in prayer. We ask him to revive us. We will find our strength returned. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah 40, 31, that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Just like Superman. Let us stand and sing our next song. It's Mission Praise 1003, My Jesus, My Saviour.
The first of our readings this morning um, comes from Exodus chapter 33, and we start to read from verse 12, and this passage is entitled, Moses and the Glory of God. Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to the Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said to Moses, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock, When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. And our second reading comes from the letter written to the church at Thessalonica and is from the first letter. And we read chapter one. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before God and our Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Amen. Thank you, Teresa. Let's stand and sing our next hymn. It's Mission Praise 1351, Spirit of God Unseen as the Wind.
for those of you confused, <laughs> I'll take it on the shoulder. That was my fault. I was lost in translation. I had a different song in mind completely. <laughs> I've never heard Skyboat song sound like that, though. That was lovely. So, <laughs> I'm hoping my pen will work here. If it doesn't, I'm just going to wave at you and ask you to move a slide on if that's all right. Thank you. So our story in Exodus this morning it reveals one of the greatest events in the life of Moses. God reveals God's glory to Moses in verse 18 to 23. Now Moses had spent 40 days with God on Mount Sinai, receiving the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And during this time, the people of God rebelled against God and built a golden calf. And this became their God whom they worshipped. Now in response, God would no longer lead them into the promised land. And the passage opens with Moses reminding God of God's own words. In verse 12, see you have said to me. Moses would lead God's people. God knew him by name. He had found favor with God. But there was a problem. His people are now under judgment. And God would no longer lead them on this journey. So in the light of verse 12, Moses asked for more knowledge of God. And more of God's favor. Moses is longing for a deeper relationship with God. However, for Moses, it's not simply about him and God. He finishes by pleading with God for his people. In verse 13, it's considered to that this nation is your people. So in response, God promises to be present with Moses wherever he goes and that he would give him rest, verse 14. But the you in this passage is singular. God's promise is for Moses alone. God will go with Moses alone and give rest also to Moses alone. But Moses doesn't give up. He pleads with God, if your presence will not go, then don't bring us up from here. Moses and the people needed God for the challenges that lay ahead. And in this presence of God that defines, it's the presence of God that defines Moses' leadership and the uniqueness of the people as the people of God. Without it, they would just be like any other nation. And Moses' persistence is answered in verse 17. God will not abandon his people. Prayer works. Now Moses was moved to seek further blessing from God. He says, please show me your glory. In verse 18. In response to Moses' audacious request... God replies, I will make my goodness pass before you. To protect Moses, God places him in the cleft of a rock and he covers his eyes as the glory of God passes by. And only when God moves away is Moses allowed to see God's goodness, mercy, compassion. And he hears the the name of the Lord. Now, this is the climax of a wonderful story. In judgment, there is forgiveness, there is mercy. Moses pleads with the Father for the souls of men and women, and the Father reveals his glory. And God loves to answer that prayer. Show me your glory. When your soul hungers, when your tank feels empty, when you're running on fumes, When you open your Bible in the morning and ask for God's help, a great go-to request. It's a simple, 
honest and humble plea. Father, show me more of your glory. God made the world to show and share his glory. He made us in his image to reflect him in the world. But we will not fully reflect him if we haven't stood in awe of him and enjoyed the beauty and majesty, changed lives and a changed world begin with seeing God's glory. Can I have another slide, please? We read in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. God, show me your glory. History hangs on that request. And one great evidence of his work in a human soul is feeling and expressing that longing for more of God. It's not only a wise request to make for ourselves, but also for others. The Apostle Paul prayed for Christians. Can I have another slide, please? I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength, which is Ephesians 1, 18 to 19. But before leading God's people up to the promised land, Moses wants to know more about God. Will he handle his stubborn, unworthy people with grace? Or is it just a matter of time before he unleashes his righteous anger on the Israelites? So Moses asks, show me more of your glory. And the next slide, please. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I'll proclaim my name the Lord in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Moses gets a glimpse into the very heart of God and he bows in worship. He asks God to draw near to his people, pardon their sin and make them his own again. God meets Moses' audacious request with favor. But then some 15 centuries later, one of Jesus' disciples receives a very different answer to that very similar plea. And the next slide, please. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, do you know me, Philip? even after I've been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. This is John 14, 8 to 10. So why does God honor Moses' plea while Jesus meets Philip with mild rebuke? Because now the glory of God is standing in front of him, fully embodied in Philip's presence, looking him in the eyes and making his misguided request. Does he not realize that he's already seen so much more than Moses? as he looks in the face of God himself and asks to see the Father. We have seen the glory of God. And God has said to Moses, you cannot see my face, in verse 20. But now Philip is seeing God. He was looking directly at the glory of God, as John 1, 14 to 18 reveals. What glory God had from Moses 
he now shows us in the person of Jesus. Can I have another slide, please? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Out of his fullness we have received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Jesus has made the Father known. The person of Christ is so truly and fully reveals God that the gospel writer can say with no need for nuance or condition or to qualify, he has made him known. Another slide, please. We read in Colossians 1.15 that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God which means the lowliest Christian has already seen more of God's glory than Moses saw on that mountaintop. As I said, God loves to answer that prayer, show me your glory. And he doesn't leave us in the dark as to where we should turn to have our prayers answered. Because when we ask God today for more of his glory, He may answer our request in countless ways. He may show us some attribute of his character that we might have missed or overlooked. He may meet some temporal need in a way that warms our souls and fills us with gratitude. He might give us a breakthrough in a relationship that was so long-standing that reconciliation seemed impossible. But the foolish response to our plea, show me your glory, is to turn our eyes to Jesus. In him, the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Colossians 2 verse 9. And our knowing the fullness of his answer doesn't mean we shouldn't ask. On the contrary, it should inspire us to ask all the more. There was another question that Moses asked on the mountaintop. In verse 16, he said, How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all other people in the face of the earth? The answer can be found in our New Testament reading in 1 Thessalonians Chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. Another slide, please. Thank you. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Christians should be imitators of Christ. It's as simple as that. If you want to know if your life imitates Christ in a way that can be seen by others, there's a checklist in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Your life, like Jesus, will produce the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So I want to leave you with this. There are three questions I believe the text asks of us. Firstly, as with the behavior of the Israelites, be honest with yourself. And ask yourself what idols that 
have you built up, have we built up that distract us from seeing more of God's glory? I'll leave you with homework this week. Ask that question of God. What idols have I built up that distract me from seeing more of your glory? And I'm not talking about golden calves. It could be a career, our possessions, our relationships, even our families, or even our church. Anything that when we truly reflect on it, we place in higher importance to our walk with God. So I challenge you to spend time in prayer this week and ask God to reveal those idols before you ask for more of his glory. But secondly, the second question is, do I reflect the glory of God? Am I an imitator of Christ? As Moses said, what else will distinguish me from all the other people on the face of the earth? Is my life filled with the fruits of the Spirit? Okay, that's maybe four questions in one. And thirdly, where did I last see the glory of God? Don't forget to remember. I love it when you read passages in the Bible and they're always looking back saying, do you remember God did this? Do you remember when God did that? Do you remember when we were saved from this situation? Because God met us here. Remembering God's faithfulness in the past lets us embrace the difficulties of the present and the uncertainties of the future gives us hope and gives us confidence. Our faith falters when we forget. And remembering specific ways he's been faithful in the past trains us to look for evidence of his goodness, his might, his faithfulness, his love, his mercy, his protection in the future. So I want you to go away. I want you to think very clearly. What stories can you share that reveal God's past acts of goodness to you? At what point have you asked God for more of his glory and he's shown up and he's moved in a powerful and wonderful way in your life? These are the stories we must share with each other. We encourage each other by telling our God stories. So it's given you something to think about this week. The bad news is I'm going to be back in two weeks and I'm going to be asking for evidence of this. Show me your homework. Amen. There's only one song we can sing when we're asking God for showing more of his glory and his mission praise 582, Rock of Ages, Cliff for me.
Please be seated. Let's come before God in prayer. Father God, you have been so good to us. Remind us often to remember, to rehearse for ourselves and the others the ways that you have been faithful. We want to be people who give you thanks and retell your stories so that others will know that you can be trusted. May we be bold enough this week to ask you to reveal our idols, to ask for forgiveness, to expel their hold over us through your Holy Spirit, and to ask you to show us your glory, more of you, Lord. Make us hungry for more of you that others will be left in no doubt that we have spent time with our Father God. And when they ask us why, may we be ready with our faith stories. We now bring our prayers of intercession before you. Gracious God, one look at our news headlines is enough to bring despair. There's so much darkness, so many bad news stories. Help us not to lose sight of you. You remain on your throne. You remain in control. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with humble hearts and lifting up the needs and concerns of those who are dear to us and those who are in need. We intercede on behalf of our loved ones, our community, and all those who are suffering. We pray for those who are sick, that you may bring them healing and comfort. We ask for strength and courage for those facing difficult challenges. We remember the lonely and the brokenhearted and ask that you wrap them in your love and provide them with compassion that they seek. Lord, prompt us to make that phone call that we've been putting off, to knock on the door, to check on a neighbor. Prompt us to act where we see need, never to be complacent in the face of need, injustice, or poverty. Lord, we lift everyone to you who was affected by the storms this week, especially the few who lost their lives. Be with those families that grieve, and we thank you this morning for the work of our emergency services, the men and women who in the face of danger and risk to life work tirelessly to rescue those in trouble. We pray this morning for all countries impacted by war and violence. We pray for a peaceful end to the war in Ukraine and plead for an end to Russian aggression towards our smaller neighbor. And merciful God, we ask for your intervention in the Gaza Strip. It's so hard to watch battles and bombings so full of innocent lives being lost on both sides. Just to satisfy the need for revenge from people who should know better than this. War only destroys life. We intercede for those who are oppressed and in need of liberation that you may bring freedom and justice to their lives. Lord, bring an end to this conflict before it escalates even more. Lord, grant wisdom and guidance to those in positions of leadership that they may make decisions that promote peace and justice. And Father, we pray also for our world that your peace may reign in every corner May your love and mercy be felt by all people and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We offer these intercessions of faith, with faith, trusting in your infinite love and wisdom. May your grace and blessings be poured out upon those we pray for and may we be instruments of your peace and love in the lives of others. We bring these prayers to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus, and we pray in the words that he taught us 
that can be followed on screen. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn this morning. It's mission praise number 51, Be Thou My Vision. Lord, you have met with us this morning. Our souls have been filled with the treasures of heaven. The hope of Jesus Christ has infused us and the Holy Spirit has challenged us. In this, you have prepared your saints for the week that lies ahead. Now send us away in the sure and certain knowledge that you go with us. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Mm-hmm.